We've uh, been talking about faith for the last several services, so I want to continue our series tonight. Uh, on Thursday, we talked about seeing other people's faith. The Bible talks about Jesus seeing their faith ministered to different people. He identified where their faith was at. But tonight, I want to talk about seeing our own faith. So the uh, title of the message tonight is Seeing Your Own Faith. Uh, I told you that the definition that I gave you guys for faith is faith is a fully persuaded, single-minded, tenacious agreement with God's word. Faith is completely convinced. It's fully persuaded. Faith is single-minded. It's not double-minded. It's not wishy-washy. It doesn't change its mind. It sets its mind towards something and sees it out to completion. It's tenacious. It doesn't give up. It doesn't quit. Because it knows that in due season you're going to reap if you don't faint. If you don't let go, if you, don't, if you hold fast to your profession of faith, you're going to see what you are believing for come to pass. You know, the Bible tells us in four different places that the just shall live by faith. One place it actually says the just shall live by his faith. And that's pretty much the point that I've been driving the last few services is that we have to live by our faith. We can't live by somebody else's faith. We receive what we need from God by our own faith. It's not somebody else's faith that makes that connection to heaven for us. You can't be saved by somebody else's faith. You can't be born again by somebody else's faith. And nowhere in Jesus' ministry did he ever say, my faith has made you whole. But he did say, your faith has made you whole. So the just shall live by his faith. So when you put that with our, with our definition of what faith is, the just shall live by a fully persuaded, single-minded, tenacious agreement with God's word. Amen. Everything that you do in life should be done by faith. And everything that you do in life should be done in a, a manner where you are fully persuaded in God's word. You're, you're single-minded about it. You, you, you don't change your mind. You don't get wishy-washy. You're tenacious. You, you're, you're determined. You're not going to give up. And you're in full agreement with God's word. You're, you're not kind of, well, I, I kind of believe God's word, but I also believe what my philosophy professor told me. No, no, we, we believe in God's word. Amen? So everything that we do in life should be, do, should be done with the goal of being so fully persuaded with what the word says that we don't hesitate to act on it. That's what faith is. You're so fully persuaded that you don't hesitate to act on it. The Bible says faith without works is dead. Our faith can't bring somebody else's miracle despite how much we would love to do so. Jesus' faith couldn't bring any great miracles to Nazareth because their unbelief overrode Jesus. I'm convinced that the reason that we see so little of the supernatural in operation today in our modern day church is that most people just don't believe in it. They haven't put their faith out there to believe what this word says, what this thing says that is available to us. Amen? I think sometimes we get comfortable with just going to church and we sing some surfacey songs and we listen to a Bible story, we listen to a shallow message, and we don't ever really exercise our faith. But the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. Everything we do in life should be done by faith. You know, I, I think much of the body of Christ, we have a form of godliness, but we're denying the power thereof. We're denying the power thereof because we're not giving the Holy Spirit room to move in power. We just sang a song just a moment ago. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Holy Spirit, we want to give you room to move in this church. And we've been seeing the Holy Spirit move in, in a very powerful way in the last few weeks. We've seen healings manifesting here. We, we saw somebody get healed instantaneously of an abscessed tooth. I mean, I mean God's good. Amen. Just give him room to move and he'll move. I think too much of the body of Christ, we don't engage in the things of the Spirit. We don't understand how the kingdom operates. We pray unscriptural prayers because of our own ignorance. The Bible says my, my people 
are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. God is saying, my people, the people that are in covenant with me, the people who should know how I operate, they're destroyed because they don't know how the word works. They don't know how the kingdom works. People don't know the difference sometimes between faith and hope. They think they're in faith, but they're actually in some sort of a hope. Well, I hope God can do this. Well, my God can do anything. Amen. Nothing's impossible to those who believe. I think sometimes we even become satisfied with maneuvering around our dysfunction rather than confronting it by faith. There's a better way. Shout that. There's a better way. There's a, better way. There's a kingdom way. There's a kingdom way. Hallelujah. There's an answer in his word, but we need to find out what it is, and then we need to put his word to work. So on Thursday, we talked about seeing people's faith, and I showed you that in certain cases, before Jesus ministered to people, he identified where their faith was. There was the, the paralyzed man on the mat. He was lowered down from the ceiling, and it says that, that you know, they, obviously they brought him to Jesus for healing, but the first thing that he said to the man on the mat, it says, seeing their faith, he, saw to, he said to the man on the mat, son, be encouraged, your, your sins are forgiven. Well, they didn't bring that man to Jesus for forgiveness, they brought him to Jesus for healing. But Jesus saw that there was some sort of hindrance to this man's faith. That's why it says, seeing their faith. Now, obviously, the man's friends had faith because they had the faith to climb up on the roof of that house, cut a hole in the roof, and lower the man down. But Jesus saw, ah, oh, there's something that's going to hinder this, so I better address this situation first. Son, be, be encouraged. Your sins are forgiven. And I, I showed you the other night that sin doesn't cause God to turn his back on you because Jesus already took the sin of the world upon himself. God turned his face from Jesus when he put the sin of the world on Jesus. But after that was done, it was finished. It was paid for. You are in right standing with God tonight because of your faith in Jesus. Now that doesn't mean that you always live right. That doesn't mean that you always make right decisions. It doesn't mean that you don't sin from time to time. But it does mean that your sin is paid for. So your sin doesn't cause God to turn his back on you. He did that on Jesus 2,000 years ago. But your sin causes your own heart to condemn you. That's why 1 John chapter 3 says, Beloved, if our heart doesn't condemn us, we have confidence before God and we can receive anything that we ask from him. So I asked you the other night, I said, why, why pray for somebody if you know that they're not going to make a connection with the kingdom? We need to identify where people's faith is before we pray for them. And, and while we're doing that, why don't we minister to the faith of the sick person or whatever their need is? Let's build up the faith of the person that we're ministering to. Amen? Now, the question came up on Thursday. Uh, what about things like the gift of faith and the gift of healing and uh, the gift of miracles? Those are listed in uh, the uh, gifts of the Spirit that are listed in 1 Corinthians and Chapter 12, 13, and 14 talks all about that. And I, I guess to, to, to sum it up in a nutshell, this is the way I look at it. God has given us the keys to his kingdom. He's given us the authority. He's given us his word. He's shown us how we can operate in the things of the kingdom. But you know, sometimes, try as we might, we just kind of come up short sometimes. And I believe what God has done is he wants so badly for us to operate in success and for us to receive his goodness and for us to receive the miracle that we need, for us to receive healing, that he also gave us these gifts of the spirit that just kind of pick up the slack for us. That's how badly he wants you to have what you need in life, that he gave you a gift of faith or a gift of healing, a gift of miracles. Now, I would prefer, myself, I would prefer to just operate in the keys to the kingdom. I would prefer to find out what this word says and just operate in that. But God knows that, you know, every once in a while, I'm, I'm not gonna, I, 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 I'm gonna have a little bit of slack there. And so he gives, he gives us this special dispensation of his grace and his mercy because he loves us just that much. 
Amen? So, the other night we were talking about seeing other people's faith. But don't you think it's important for us to be able to identify where our own faith is? To see our own faith. So the first thing that I want to tell you tonight about seeing your own faith is be honest with yourself when evaluating your own faith. Be honest with yourself. Ask yourself questions like this. Do I really believe so much so that I'm willing to act upon that belief? Amen? Do I really believe that what, I, what I'm asking God for, what, what I'm believing God for, am I willing to act on that belief? Can I share your story, Bob? Bob came up to me before service tonight. Now, we know that Bob and, and Donna, they are believing God to sell their house here in Naples because they are building a house in the north part of the state. Now, they've already packed up their things in the house here, and they had a buyer, and that deal fell through. And so now they're waiting to see, okay, what's going to happen because we can't close on the house that we're building until we can close that on the house here in Naples. What should we do? Now, the temptation is, let's take all the stuff that we packed out of our house and put it back in the house. Because after all, I mean, who, who wants to live in an RV? Right? But they, they made the determination this week we are not going to unpack our stuff. We're going to go ahead and send our stuff up to uh, up north. And in fact, uh, he told me, he says, we're even disconnecting our cable television. <laughs> All right? Their acts are the proof of where their faith is. Yeah. And we're going to see that thing come to pass. Yeah. And I'm going to stand here from this pulpit and I'm going to tell you all about it. Yeah. All right? So do I really believe so much so that I'm willing to act on my belief? Faith is so fully persuaded that it's not afraid to act on what it believes. Now, here's the thing. If you're not fully in faith, when you're evaluating yourself and you're, you're asking, do I really believe? And, and, and when you come to the answer that, no, I, I don't think I really do believe, don't fall into condemnation. Okay? Like everything else in Christianity, this thing is a process. So just start feeding your faith, start starving your doubt, start nurturing your faith, and start exercising your faith. It's going to grow. It's going to work. The Word of God is an amazing thing. It's the only thing in the universe that can build your faith. How do we know that? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God will build your faith. It's, it's an amazing thing. No matter how many television shows you watch, that can't build your faith. No matter how many other books that you read, that can't build your faith. But this thing right here can actually build your faith. So, so when, you, when you evaluate yourself and you're like, you know, I'm just not quite there yet. Don't beat yourself up because of that. Don't give in to condemnation because of that. Just understand, okay, it's all right. I'm not quite there yet, but I can get there. It's possible. I want to share a, a story with you. There was a church that I used to lead worship for in Ohio, and one of my singers, uh, her name was Amy. <clears throat> her name still is Amy. <laughs> she, hasn't she hasn't changed her name. <clears throat> well, she changed her last name when she got married, but that's a different story. So uh, Amy, when she was about probably 19 or 20 years old, they noticed um, her belly started to swell. And when this first happened, uh, she thought that she was just kind of gaining weight. But then she really uh, focused on exercising right and eating right. And she noticed that, I mean, the rest of her body was staying trim, but her belly was continuing to grow. And the doctors told her that she had some sort of a tumor. And they really couldn't identify exactly what it was. And, uh, but they, they told her, you know, if you can live with it, then just go ahead and live with it because we don't really know what to do about it. <clears throat> and she went to several different doctors. 
it was affecting the curvature of her spine. Uh, it was affecting her posture. And one of the things that was, for her, it was embarrassing, was it made her look like she was a little bit pregnant. Well, you can't be a little bit pregnant. <clears throat> you're either pregnant or you're not. Um, like she uh, was in her early stages of pregnancy. There, I got it, had to correct myself on that. <clears throat> and it was embarrassing because she was single and she was the pastor's daughter. And so people come to church and they're like, oh, the pastor's daughter, she's pregnant. Well, she wasn't pregnant, but she had this growth in her belly. And it was, you know, it wasn't very attractive and um, it caused whispers and things like that. And she eventually, uh, she got used to living with it. And she just kind of maneuvered around her dysfunction. She would wear clothes that kind of covered it up and uh, she just got used to it. And she had had this thing for, I believe it was somewhere around six or seven years. And she just had it all the time, this belly that made her look like she was a few months pregnant. And one day she came to church and she was listening to a sermon. Her dad was preaching on healing. And she went home. Uh, now, by this time, she was married. She went home and uh, she, she realized, you know what? I'm so accustomed to this thing that I'm not really exercising my faith for it. I've learned to just live with it. I've learned to maneuver around the dysfunction. I've, I've learned how to sit in such a way that it's, it, it's not uncomfortable. And the way that I walk and the way that I dress and everything, I'm just kind of maneuvering around it. I'm not really in faith for it. Now, she didn't get in, in condemnation over it. She just realized, I'm not quite there yet. And so what she did was she determined that she was going to get herself into faith. And she said for 30 days, she turned off the television, she turned off the radio, she turned off social media, and she did nothing but immerse herself in the Word of God for one month, for 30 days. She said, all I did was I read books on healing, I meditated on healing scriptures, I prayed, I worshiped God, I meditated on the Word, and all I did was just immerse myself in the Word of God. She says, it took me about a month and she said, I finally got to the place where I believed, yes, healing is mine. Now, this is amazing because she was my singer for was one of my singers for six years. And I had actually seen her get healed of other things in the six years that she sang for me. But uh, this particular thing, she just her, her faith hadn't been there. But she, she finally got to the place where she said, I'm in faith now. I, I know what the word says, and I'm convinced that this healing is mine. So that Sunday, she went to church. She came forward for prayer. She had the pastor and several of the elders lay hands on her and pray for her. And she said, I went home from church, and I didn't feel any different, but I knew it was done. That moment was the moment that she released her faith for her healing. What, what does the Bible say? Believe that you receive when you pray and you shall have it. Now, she didn't go down to pray until she knew that she believed that she could receive. She identified where her faith was at. She wasn't going to waste other people's time praying over something when she knew she really wasn't in faith. So she got herself into the point where she knew, yes, this promise is mine. She came forward. She released her faith as they prayed for her. And a few nights later, she got ready for bed, like she always did, and she brushed her hair, and she took her makeup off, and you know she got dressed for bed, and she weighed herself, because she always did that before she went to bed. And the next morning, she woke up, this was just a few days after they prayed for her, she woke up, and her husband, laying in bed next to her, he rolled over and looked at her and said, Amy, look at your belly. And her belly was completely flat. She got up out of bed, she looked in the mirror, she saw that her belly was completely flat. She uh, measured her waist and she went and weighed herself. Overnight, she lost nine inches on her waist and 13 pounds in one night. Now I wanna show you a picture of Amy. This is two pictures actually. 
One is a picture of her the day before she got healed. She had gone to the mall. And the other one is a picture of her the day after she got healed. Here's a picture of her. See her belly on the left. See how it's kind of bulging? And see how flat it is on the right? That, that is what happened to her overnight. Amen? That's what happens when you are so fully persuaded, fully convinced, single-minded, tenaciously in agreement with God's word. She made a connection with the kingdom and she received her miracle. Amen? Is that awesome? <clears throat> if you can give yourself an honest assessment of your own faith, you won't delude yourself into thinking that God's word doesn't work. That's an important thing for us to understand. If you can give yourself an honest assessment of your own faith, you won't delude yourself into thinking that God's word doesn't work. If you're not there yet, don't fall into condemnation. Don't give up. Just own up to it and say, I'm not there yet, but God's word says that I can get there. I personally, I am always cautious about using the phrase or overusing the phrase I'm believing for. A lot of Christians say, well, I'm believing for this. I'm believing for that. Because sometimes I have to be honest with myself and say, I'm not really believing for that. I should be, but I'm not. You know, I, I, I don't want to delude myself into thinking that I'm in faith when I'm really not. So let's talk about, because again, if you're not there, that's okay. Let's talk about how our faith can grow and how our faith can mature. All right? Let's go to Mark chapter 4. I want to show you something. This is a really good principle. I think you're going to like this. Mark chapter 4, verses 3 through 9, says this. This is Jesus giving a, a parable, the parable of the sower. Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, and produced. Some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said to them, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, I told you this the other night. Whenever you see that phrase, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, what Jesus is saying is there's a deeper spiritual principle in this parable that I just gave you. This principle is not just about a farmer planting seeds. There's a deeper spiritual principle to learn here. So whenever you see that, what he's saying is, he who has ears to hear what the Spirit has to say, he who has the ability to hear with spirit ears, listen and pay attention because there's a deeper kingdom principle to learn here. There's a, there's a meaning in this parable that goes beyond the obvious. There's a mystery to be revealed here. And Jesus wants you to find out what the mystery is. So... The disciples, they wanted to know an, an explanation of what this parable was about. So in verse 10, he said this. But when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parable. In verse 13, and he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Next verse. The sower sows the word. Everybody say that. The sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. So what Jesus is explaining to them is this parable that I just gave you, it's not about farming. It's about the word. The sower sows the word and the heart is where it's sown into. Okay? So the word of God is a seed. The word of God is a seed and the heart is is the ground that receives the seed of the word of God. Now notice that he said in verse 13, he says, if you don't get this, how are you going to understand any parable? If you don't understand this particular principle, then you can't understand any parable. So look at the person next to you and say, you got to get this. All right. So 
Now, let's skip down a few verses. We're still in Mark chapter 4. Let's skip down to verse 26. We're still talking about this sower sowing seed. And he said, The kingdom of God, as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow, he himself does not know how. So when a, when a farmer plants seed into the ground, that seed turns into a plant and the farmer doesn't know how the ground does it. All he knows is that he has to plant the seed. The ground does the rest. Next verse. For the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the head. After that, the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle. Everybody say immediately. Immediately, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. All right. So in verse 26, he says the kingdom of God is like a man who scatters seed. What is the seed? The word. The word, the word of God is a seed. Verse 28, it says the earth yields crops or the ground yields crops. What, what's the ground? The heart. The heart. The heart. So, is God talking about the seed and earth and crops? No, he's talking about the word and your heart. There's a deeper kingdom principle to learn here. Now, let me ask you this. What does the word of God produce in your heart? There, you just said it. Faith. Amen? Amen. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When the word of God is sown into your heart, it produces faith. Amen? So with that in mind, I want to reread that scripture that we just read in verse 26 through 29. But I'm going to make a, a few changes because we're, we're going to look at this from the perspective of what we know Jesus is talking about. And Jesus said, the kingdom of God as if, is as if a man should scatter the word of God on his heart. You see how I, I changed that and I changed the color of it because that's really what he's talking about. The seed represents the word. The ground represents the heart. The kingdom of God is, if, is, is as if, that's hard to say, is as if a man should scatter the word of God on his heart and should sleep by, day, by night and rise by day and the word of God should sprout and grow faith in his heart. He himself does not know how. In other words, the heart has the ability to turn the word of God into faith. Just like the ground has the ability to turn seed into a plant. The heart has the ability. Now, we don't know how the heart does that. We just know that God pr produced our heart and made our heart in a way that it takes the word of God and turns it into faith. He should sleep by night, rise by day. And the word of God should sprout and grow faith in his heart. He himself does not know how. Next verse. For the heart yields faith by itself. First the blade, then the head. After that, the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So this entire passage is about how the heart receives the word of God and turns it into a crop of faith. A faith that, when fully matured, produces a harvest. Amen? Amen? The farmer doesn't know how the ground produces a crop. We don't know how the heart produces faith. We don't have to know how the heart produces faith. We just have to know that it does. I walk into a dark room. I may not know anything about voltage and wattage and amperage and lumens and positive and negative and ground and I don't know any of that stuff. Sherry knows that kind of stuff. She's an electrician. But if I walk into a dark room, all I gotta know is where's the light switch? Okay, I don't have to know how it works in order to make it work for me. I don't have to know how the heart turns the word of God into faith. All I gotta know is if I keep sowing the word of God into my heart, my faith is gonna grow. Amen? Now. The Bible says that the word of God is a seed, right? Seed always comes from a mature organism, right? Puppies can't reproduce. Full-grown dogs can. Babies can't reproduce. 
Full-grown humans can. You can plant an apple seed and it will turn into a plant that will grow into an apple tree, but it will be years before that apple tree can reproduce. So seed comes from something that is mature. Y'all follow on me? The seed of the word of God comes from a mature word. God's word is mature. God's word is complete. God's word is finished. God's word doesn't lack anything. So the seed that comes from this word, this word is complete. So when you plant the seed of the word of God into your heart, it produces faith. Let's go back to verse 28. Produces faith. The heart yields faith by itself. First the blade, then the head, and after that the full grain in the head, and then the grain will ripen. In other words, there's a process for that faith to grow. So you have, I'm, I'm just going to say you have a plant that represents the word of God. You got a, a fully mature word plant. And a seed from that word plant gets planted into your heart. And that seed begins to grow. Just first the blade, then the head, then the full grain in the head. And then that thing fully matures. And, and, and here's, here's, here's the key to making your faith work. When your faith matures to the point that it looks exactly like the word that it came from, that's when the harvest comes. When your faith matures to the point that it looks exactly like the promises, when it's fully in agreement, it looks like a mirror image of the word that it came from, immediately the harvest is gathered. You, you missed a great opportunity to shout right there. That's where your harvest is gathered. Amen? The heart receives the word. It produces faith. It nurtures that faith into full maturity. And when faith is fully mature, at that moment, immediately your harvest is manifested. That's an awesome process, folks. That's exciting to know that your heart was designed to turn the word of God into a faith and nurture it into full maturity. That's an awesome process. So what I want to tell you tonight is, if for some reason you're feeling like, well, you know, I'd like to believe God for this miracle. I'd like to believe God for this healing. I'd like to believe God for, you know, the... the, the, the closure on my house or, or whatever it is that you need God to do for you, don't fall into condemn, condemnation when you say, oh, I, I just don't think my faith is there yet. I just, I don't know if I can believe God. No, your heart is nurturing that faith into maturity. So just keep nurturing it. Keep feeding your faith. Keep, keep meditating on the, on the things of God. Turn the TV off if you have to. Okay, turn off Dr. Phil. He, he doesn't have the answer. This, this has answers for you. Amen? Keep nurturing your faith. Keep feeding your faith. Keep starving your doubt. Keep meditating on the word. And eventually that faith is going to grow into a plant that looks just like the word of God that it came from. And when that happens, immediately your harvest comes. Amen? Now let's go back to verse 13. Jesus said... To the disciples, he says, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Jesus was saying, this is the most important parable in the Bible. This parable describes the process by which your heart receives the word of God and turns it into faith. If you don't understand this process, then you may as well not learn any process in, the, in Scripture because this is what all of it hinges on. The process by which your heart turns the Word of God into faith. 
If you don't get this, you can't get anything. If you can't grasp the principle of this parable, you can't understand the principles of any parable. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus says, everything that I'm trying to teach you hinges on your understanding of this kingdom process. The process by which your heart turns God's word into faith. You must get this. So just shout this. Shout, I get it. I get it. Amen. So turn to somebody else and say, I get it. I get it. Amen. Just throw your hands in the air and say this. I may not be there yet, but my faith is growing. My faith is maturing. And when it reaches full maturity, when my faith looks just like the word of God, my harvest, my healing, my miracle, my answer will immediately be manifested. If you believe it, give God a shout. Amen. Amen.